To say that longtime craft retailer Joanne Fabrics is in trouble would be an understatement. We have so much to talk about, it's not even funny. Welcome to Sewing Report Live. I'm Jen coming at you from my bedroom office, and I have been working all yesterday and most of today to compile a large, large chunk of information on everything that's going on. We are going to be looking at the latest with Joanne Fabrics. The stock price has reached a new low today. This company appears to be in complete freefall. We are looking into Joanne's corporate leadership team. I've been talking to an employee that actually works at Joanne, so we're going to hear what they have to say. We're going to be reading all of your comments from the last show, and we are getting into sort of a timeline of all of the events that has been swirling around all of this chaos. But guys, this is going to be absolutely wild. And real quick, I want to take a second to ask a quick favor. We are about 150 subscribers away from 1000, which is what I need to get this channel monetized. If you could help me out here, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and hit that like button and subscribe to Sewing Report Live. Shows like this take quite a bit of time to put together, and I'd like to be able to do more of this and getting this channel monetized would go a long way to help me out. So that would be greatly appreciated. I also want to take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor, which is the Sewing Report Etsy shop. We currently have some fabric bundles on sale. By the way, thank you to everyone who shopped with me over the weekend. So we do have some things on sale. I've got fabric, sewing supplies, and some handmade items. So again, this is another way you can show support for the work that I'm doing here. But yes, this is a not monetized stream. So hey, I got to plug my own Etsy shop, right guys? But thank you all for watching. We are going to have, we're, hopefully we can learn, learn a lot tonight. I have been doing a crap load of research. Like when I say research, I mean research. I spent all day yesterday looking things up. I'm not joking. I have like 30 tabs open on Google Chrome. It's kind of insane. We have a lot to talk about. And this company appears to be in some some serious trouble, like for real serious trouble. I've been lurking on the Joanne Fabric subreddit. There are some pretty crazy rumors swirling around that are not confirmed yet. But if you want to sort of lurk over there and see what people are talking about, a lot of the employees are posting. So it's r slash Joanne Fabrics. Uh, but that in, a lot of that information is unconfirmed. And I want to stick with stuff that's actually attributable to sources down below in the description box. You can also, I've linked all of the sources I'm using. I, although I did find a few literally about five minutes before we started, I learned some more information. So after this uh, live stream is over, I will be updating the list. But again, this is not just stuff that's a rumor. This is stuff that is confirmed or things that we actually no, I don't want to do a lot of speculation because that's not very helpful. But if you'd like to look at all of my sources, I've linked them all in the description box. But thank you for watching. So here's what we're going to be doing. I'm going to start off by giving a recap of what's what's what the latest is at Joann's. I'm going to be going over some of the leadership team. We're going to be looking into the former CEO, Wade Michelon. Whoa, quite a ride there. And we're also going to be looking at uh, the sort of the timeline of events. Towards the end, I will be reading a lot of your comments from the last live stream and from Instagram. And I'll also be taking some periodic breaks to read the live chat. So shout out to everyone watching live and on the replay. Leave a chat, leave a comment. Uh, you can also, if you if you feel so inclined, you now have the option to leave super chats on the live stream. If you would like to do so, that would be awesome too. Uh, I will give priority to super chats, but hopefully we can get to everyone's comment as well. But that's kind of a kind of a new thing for the channel. But we are going live. This is probably going to be kind of a longer show as well. So if you are what you know, you can take a break. You can come back. That's the good thing about live streams. You can always come back and rewatch them. So all right, we gotta. Here's the latest, guys. And uh, Joanne's stock. Whoa. It's now at 86 cents. Yes, 86 cents. During our last show over the weekend, 
it had closed out at like not, I think it was 90 or 91 cents. Now, Joann's went public in March. It had actually been a publicly traded company years ago. It was bought out by a private equity company. And then the private equity company took it public again in 2021. Now, they had experienced a kind of an artificial boom of sales from the pandemic and from COVID. So the stock initially started off around $12. At its high, it was around $16. And check it out. So since August of 2022, it's it's had some highs and lows, but it's been a steady decline. And this is where the stock is now. The stock is now at 86 cents. So I guess it's a bargain. I wouldn't say not, not financial advice, but I don't know if this is a, a buy. Uh, but I want to do a quick update. Um, I know we went over this all on the last show, but here's sort of the... Uh, the gist of things. So last week, Joanne Corporate laid off a number of employees. We don't know how many at the corporate headquarters in Hudson, Ohio. Now, there's a state website. Whenever a corporation or a large company makes uh, layoffs, I think over a certain amount, they have to uh, file like a report with the with like a state agency. I did check out the website and I did not see Joanne's on there yet. So I. That, that might take a little bit to update, but they have to they have to state like how many employees are laid off and whatnot. But it looks like there were a number of uh, head, there there was definitely a headcount reduction at the corporate headquarters. And let me kind of go over the gist. And now this is what the employees have stated. Um, I did talk to a someone who's a um, in a management role at Joann's, but at the store level. Many of the, uh, so it looks like the stores kept the store, like the general manager, which is like the top, they kept the assistant store manager and many of the full-time positions, like the uh, key holder, like floor managers, a lot of those positions appear to be, uh, e they were either offered a severance package and from the amounts I was seeing, people were saying it was not, it was not a lot of money. It was like a couple thousand dollars to leave and get the severance package, or they could get demoted into a part-time position, which would mean that these employees would lose their benefits. And also that came with a pay cut. So the pay cuts I was seeing were fairly significant. Like if, for example, I think one, ex one person said they went from like $14 to like $9. So the pay was like not terrible before, but the pay cut was closer to the minimum wage in whatever area they're in. Uh, and other, besides, also they were, again, if you're going down to part-time, uh, you don't get the benefits, you don't get like health insurance or, you know, like PTO and stuff like that. Uh, all of the new hires that are brought in are being brought in close to minimum wage. And I'm hearing that a lot of these stores are now severely understaffed. So a store may only have two to three employees at a time. And a lot of you, by the way, this is super helpful. You were kind of reporting back to what you were seeing at your local stores. And I saw kind of a mixed bag, but a lot of people were saying that at their local stores, there were there were um, hardly any employees there. And also some of these stores were reducing their hours. So it does look like from a corporate down decision, the stores were allotted fewer hours for labor. And it also seems like a lot of the employees are having to kind of pick up the slack for the reduction in the workforce and reduction in hours and having to do a lot more than they were before. Uh, I've also seen that some regional VPs or like district managers are gone. And some of these employees are reporting that there are some facilities issues so say the air conditioning unit breaks or some of the light fixtures are out that it's taking a really long time to get anyone out there to fix these issues. So they're going for fairly long periods of time uh, with, with like broken facilities. So that's sort of the gist of everything. I want to go into, let me show you this article from the other day. Uh, we will we'll kind of give you the latest. Uh, this was really probably the, this was probably the best article I saw about what's happening. And this was from uh, The Street. 
So this says a bankrupt bankruptcy watch. Another beloved retailer may disappear. The company has issued a warning and laid off staff, but that may not stop it from running out of cash, even though it insists it won't. All right, let's uh, scroll down. And again, if you're coming in here and you watched the other day, I, I just wanted to give sort of a recap to anyone who's who's new to this. Uh, but it looks like Joanne's right now does not have. All okay, right, so the company does not have a lot of cash. They've got over $1 billion in debt. They've also been experiencing quarterly losses and their sales are not as good as they were a couple of years ago. So that's sort of the gist of it. Also, the company is running the risk of being delisted off of the NASDAQ. That move would make it harder to raise capital uh, because the stock, again, is below a dollar. Shares are down 68% this year and off 90% from a peak close of $16.92 in 2000. Uh, 21. Uh, Joann's was founded in Cleveland in 1943. It describes itself as the nation's category leader in sewing with one of the largest assortments of arts and crafts products. Uh, the chain opened 2022 with about 22,000 full-time, part-time, seasonal, and temporary workers. And it currently operates about 829 physical stores in 49 states as of late August. So that's sort of the gist about what's happening. But in this show, I really want to get into sort of the the who's in charge at Joann's, what's going on, and sort of the backstory. And, and I've been finding some pretty interesting information about uh, the leadership the leadership team, how much they're paid, and some other things. So we are going to be talking about that. So this is the Joann's page for investors. So this is, you know, they're trying to appeal to people, you know, who want to buy stock or, you know, become an investor. And uh, this is the, let's see here. All right. So there's the management team and then there's the board of directors. And you're probably like, who, who's in charge of all this? All right. So we're going to get into the CEO that left earlier in this year, but this is the current uh, leadership team. And the Joanne's currently has two people acting as interim CEOs. They're not official CEOs. They're just the ones that are doing the job duties right now. And those two are uh, Christopher DiTullio and uh, Scott Sekula. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. We've also got Janet. Uh, we got Robert here. Anne, Joe, Lisa Whitman Smith, uh, John. So these are the folks. And uh, the funny thing is... When I was doing my research last night, there was another face on here that is no longer there, and I found out why. Uh, so we are going to talk about that. Uh, but here's the thing I noticed when I was looking into, I, I read literally all of the bios of all of these people. And one thing I did notice is that not, none of them, they they have business experience, but none of them actually have any other business working for any type of sewing, fabric, or crafting company? They they're like they have retail experience, but it's all like, you know, again, I think that's one of the issues is that I, in my opinion, I think Joanne leadership doesn't really understand the customer or the people that would shop at Joanne's. So you got like this guy, Christopher uh, DiTullio, no offense to him or anything. But if you look at his background, it's stuff like J.C. Penney, Home Place, Cole Vision. They all went to like business school, or they have like an MBA, or they're a lawyer, or something like that. Um, some of these people have been with Joanne's for a long period of time, but some of these folks are very new. And I was just, I thought it was funny to look at the background because, like, none of these people really strike me as like crafters or people who know anything about sewing or stuff. I mean, what do you guys think? Like, do these people look like? they're going at home in quilting or they're going at home and sewing up something. Also notice there's like, all right, one, two, three, there's like five dudes and three females. So, I mean, you know, I don't know. We could also make some other assumptions. I'm not going to go there. Um, I also want one person also had a pretty interesting. Okay. There were, all right. So this, this lady, uh, Janet, she worked at in the human resources department at Pacific Sunwear, the wet seal Nordstrom, Again, not bad experience. Luxottica show in sunglass, freaking sunglass hut. So, you know, she 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 works with eyewear and stuff. But I want to ask, what does this lady know about crafting or sewing or knitting or anything? 
I think this is part of the problem, honestly. I got to find this too, because one person had a, a, a kind of a funny uh, background too. All right, again, let, let's look at another person. You know, worked at random places, just kind of plug. It's like these, they're kind of plugging, you know, it's like they're kind of plugging people in. But, you know, it's like, do they care about what they know about the Joanne's customer or the Joanne products? I, I mean, who knows? I thought it was funny. One of these people, I got to find it, but one of these people came from Lockheed Martin. So, hey, just saying they, you know, they know about war and stuff, but uh, that doesn't really have a lot to do. This guy, to his credit, he has been with Joanne's for uh, 19 years. We're, I want to find the Lockheed Martin person because I thought that was kind of a hoot. All right, this person like Macy's, Dick's Sporting Goods, you know, I mean, I, I just really wanted a sports authority. What the hell does that have to do with, like, how would he be an expert on what to do with a, like a craft and sewing store? I don't really know. I think that there's some questions there. I really want to find that Lockheed Martin person because that just seems, yeah, they don't look like these people. Does John look like a crafter to you? I just really, really want to know that. So that was my impression from looking at the management team. Is that like how in touch are these people with the average crafter or the average, you know, sewing enthusiast? Does Scott look like he goes home on the weekends and makes cakes or scrapbooks or something? I don't know. No, I mean, maybe he does, not to not to stereotype, but like I worked in corporate America too. And I will say from my experience, hardly anyone I knew working in newsrooms, hardly any of them knew anything about, you know, sewing or whatever. But yeah, there was one person I, I'm trying to remember because they came from Lockheed Martin and I just wanted to laugh. Again, this lady also came from Luxottica. So she knows about like, you know, she likes glasses. But again, what do these people really know about like crafting? All right, let's also look at the board of directors. So the board of, okay, I think one of these, okay, I think it was one of these people that came from Lockheed Martin. Again, so we got Anne, we got Daryl, Jonathan, Lily, Mary Beth, Brian. Let's take a look at some of their bios here. All right, Anne. And also a lot of the board seats are taken up by the, there's actually a private equity firm that controls Joanne's. I will explain that. Oh, this is the Lockheed Martin lady. Okay. So she, she worked for Zappos again, shoes, Amazon. Okay. Oh yeah. Owned by Amazon Crocs. You know, she, she knows shoes. And I just love that she has experience at Lockheed Martin. I just find that kind of hilarious. Are we going to get some former CIA uh, you know, officers here or something. We got Daryl here. You came from like Fred Myers again, sports authority. Like, I think this is part of the, I honestly think this is part of their problem is that these people just, you know, they don't know shit about what we want. I mean, that's just, I think that's a pretty safe assumption to make. All right. The container store banking, Whole Foods. It's like they, I feel like these people have sort of like they, they sort of an arrogance, like they, they've been successful at one business. So they think they can do any sort of business, even though many of these businesses might not, you know, like it doesn't always apply. You know, we got Lily here. She was from LGP. Oh, okay. That's the, I think that's the private equity firm. Nissan, Disney, Procter and Gamble. Okay. Let's see here. All right. We, I think we looked at Jonathan. We got Mary Beth here. I don't know what the hell sneeze is. Leapfrog. Is that that like, um, is that like the toy for kids? I think it looks like, I don't know what the hell Walmart. Okay. Health and fitness Lowe's Walmart, China. Okay. So she knows about some home improvement shit. What does she know about crafts? We got Brian here. Does Brian look like he knows how to operate a sewing machine? He's the, okay. So this, He's the vice president at Leonard Green and Partners. And this is the private equity firm that actually controls a lot of Joanne's. So we're going to talk about that. So that's sort of the leadership group with uh, with Joanne's. Okay, so here's sort of the, okay. And I also want to talk about um, 
let, let, all right, let's let's talk. I want to do the let's do kind of a timeline, and then we'll also get into some of the executives that I really want to do more of a deep dive in. Okay, so Joanne's previously had been a publicly traded company up until about 2010, when this private equity firm Leonard Green and Partners uh, offered to buy Joanne's for 1.6 billion dollars in cash. So this private equity firm took Joanne's private. So Joanne's had previously been a publicly traded company. Then they went private. So here's an article about that. So, so from about 2000, you know, whenever this deal closed, probably 2011, because this article is December of 2010. So probably from about, for about 10 years, Joanne's was privately owned and operated by this Leonard Green uh, private equity firm here. All right. So let me try to get to their website here. Guys, I have so many tabs open here. It's not even funny. All right. Let me Leonard Green and Partners. Let me bring up their website. So let's take a look at the private equity firm uh, that purchased. This is the private equity firm. We Guys, we just love corporate America, don't we? We just love private equity firms. <laughs> I'm I'm being totally sarcastic here. So this is LGP, Leonard Green and Partners. They're a leading private equity investment firm founded in 1989 and based in Los Angeles with approximately $70 billion of assets under management. Our firm partners with our experienced management teams and often with founders to invest in market leading companies. Since inception, we have invested in over 120 companies in the form of traditional buyouts, going private transactions, recapitalizations, growth equity, and selective public equity and debt positions. We primarily focus on companies providing services, including consumer health care and business services, as well as retail, distribution, and industrials. So I looked at their uh, website, and it was equally as like corporate. So these are the folks... Now, these are the folks that are really behind Joanne's. So take a look at these. Okay, Lily, yeah, re re you recognize these two from the Joanne's uh, board of directors here. So these are the folks that are uh, really in charge of Joanne Fabrics, even though it's a publicly traded company. And we will talk about that. So I want to ask, out of all of these faces, do you really feel like these folks are in touch with the uh, average crafter or sewing enthusiast. I, uh, not to be judgmental, but I would probably guess these people aren't really into that sort of thing. Um, just, just wild guess here. Wild guess. What do you guys think? And also, if any of them, all right, let's play a game here. Out of any of these people, who would you most who would you guess is most likely to know how to use a sewing machine out of all of these people at uh, Leonard Green and Partners? Do you think any of these people have ever been? Do you think any of these people have shopped at a Joanne Fabrics? Do you think any of these people have ever done scrapbooking? Do you think any of these people have ever made anything outside of like kindergarten finger painting or whatever? So these are the folks that are working at this private equity firm. And these are the people who are actually running the show. So that is Leonard Green and uh, Leonard uh, Green and, and Partners. All right, so I wanna show you this. This is another article. This is, two, two, so all right, 10 years pass. This uh, LGP private equity firm owns and operates Joann's, right? So, 2021 is when the company went public again. And what happened? Now, notice the timing. 2021 was about a year into the COVID pandemic. And the our industry saw record sales, record interest from everyone being at home and everyone being cooped up, wanting to learn how to do things, wanting to learn how to make masks. So uh, Joanne saw unprecedented growth. And that's when they decided to take the company uh, public again. So you can see this article from Forbes, you know, talking about how they're riding the pandemic wave, which a lot of businesses did. A lot of businesses got an artificial boost from the pandemic 
And from people working from home, having more time, you know, having a little more disposable income due to all the stimulus checks and whatnot. So, uh, you know, and my channel saw a lot of growth during that time too, because people were, you know, were trying to get into learn new hobbies. People were trying to make bread. People were, you know, spending more time with their families. Um, you know, and I do, I do want to say that one thing I think a lot of us sort of forgot about is, do you remember at the start of the pandemic when we were all getting into the mask making and it was a big thing? Do you remember when Joann's had that, um, had that program they announced where they were going to be helping people make masks? Like they were going to be doing a big effort. Let me find the press release because I'm sure it exists. Let's see, mask making. So Joann's was offering uh, free materials to make masks and you could make them in the store and whatnot. And then they were going to be allegedly figuring out how, you know, they were going to be like a drop off point for, um, for all the masks. Cause I remember announcing it on the sewing report. I remember telling you guys about it. So here is their announcement from, I think this was from 2020 and they made a big, you know, and again, companies like Joann's do this for the publicity, uh, you know, not just out of the goodness of their heart, but uh, Joann's, yeah, again, was had announced that they were going to be, they they had their own mask pattern, and then they were going to be um, giving out free materials. And do y'all remember, though, that this thing ended up being like a huge fail? So even though they said all of this, a lot of people were saying that the stores were like a mess and that this program like was not happening as they were stating it was. People would go, they didn't actually have free fabric for masks or you would only get like, like they were so limited, like you would only get enough to make like one mask. So this, this whole effort ended up being like a big cluster. And a lot of people were like, what the hell is up with this? So their effort to try to like help out with this COVID mask sewing really didn't go very well. And I feel like a lot of, you know, I feel like a lot of us sort of forgot about it because we're like, oh, it was like two, you know, was it three years ago now? And I, I think a lot of us forgot about it, but I was reminded of it when I was like re doing all this research. So let's check out. All right. So this is the Forbes article again. Again, this is from 2021. Uh, all right. So it says, Joanne is coming off a strong year in which it added more than 8 million new customers and saw sales at existing stores climb 38% since May 1st. This, that helped the company pull in a net income of, um, let's see here, $174 million on sales of $1.9 billion in the 39 weeks ending October of 2020. It is in part riding on the coattails of pandemic winners like Etsy, eBay, and Shopify, which have helped a number of small businesses get online quickly at a time when e-commerce is booming. And a lot of Etsy shops popped up in 2020. Because, you know, again, people are home. People are like, oh, now is the time to start my small business. Okay, so this article is sort of leaning up to the IPO, right? Okay, so early 2021, Joanne files for the 100. I think it ended up being more than that, but they filed for the IPO. So this is an article from February of 2000, uh, 2021. A uh, crafting retailer, Joanne, has filed a proposed $100 million initial public offering with the SEC, the proceeds of which it intends to use for general corporate purposes. According to Renaissance Capital, the initial filing is a likely placeholder for what it estimates could be a $400 million IPO deal. The Tuesday filing comes as IPOs hit a two-decade high. Currently owned by Leonard Green & Partners, Joanne would still be controlled by the private equity firm after its IPO. This is pretty interesting here. All right, so let's take a look at this. All right, the IPO cash allows provides an opportunity to pay down some debt and for private equity owners to reap some profit from their investments. Of course, it's not the only means for private equity firms to make money from their investments. In past years, Joanne's sponsors pulled $5 million a year out of the company in the form of management fees. The fees continued even as the company's debt made its way onto Fitch's loans of concerns list. Through October of 2020, though, Leonard Green and Partners took only $800,000. Okay. Uh, those management payments, which are set to stop after the IPO, are dwarfed by the company's interest expenses, which in past years have topped $100 million. 
As of October, this is 2020, uh, I think this is 2020, uh, the company's long-term debt stood at $921.6 billion, million, uh, down from a peak of $1.3 billion in 2019. Okay, Joanne's sector has been helped by the pandemic with the surge in DIY activity. All right, blah, 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 blah. Okay. All right, yeah. Joanne's cited that uh, 30% of Americans were sewing or repairing clothes during the pandemic. That seems really high to me, though. Uh, Joanne estimates it has about a third of the sewing market, making a le it a leader in the category. So again, you can read all of these articles. They are all linked below if you want to do your own research, which I would definitely encourage you to do if you this is something you're uh, interested in. All right, sales grew more than 24% last year through October. Okay, Michael's also grew. All right, so this is about filing the IPO. Okay, this is from Market Watch, and I hope this isn't paywalled. Okay. So this is in March of 2021. And I, I learned quite a bit from this article too. Okay. All right. Arts and crafts retailer Joanne Inc.'s shares rose in their trading debut Friday before surrendering those games gains with the company's initial public offering priced at $12 a share below its proposed price range of $15 to $17. They initially sold 10.9 million shares to raise $130.8 million. So that's what Joanne's raised with the IPO. All right. The stock started trading on the NASDAQ Friday under the ticker Joanne with 1N, 11 banks underwriting. Uh, let's see. Here. Okay. So Joanne was previously a publicly traded company, but was taken private by private equity firm Leonard Green and Partners in 2011 and a $1.6 billion deal that left it saddled with debt. So it looks like the private equity firm, to me, it looks like one of the reasons they wanted this IPO was to help, uh, you know, pay down the debt or help manage the debt, maybe. All right, Joanne's do do do. Okay. All right. The tailwinds Joanne has enjoyed during COVID-19 were accompanied by headwinds. Okay. Like tariffs on Chinese imports, uh, wrote Wade McKellen. Uh, Michelon, chief executive of Joanne, okay, was able to reduce its debt. Um, okay, and you can see the company has been, yeah, so Wade McKellen is the most recent CEO at Joanne, and he had been, he was the CEO from February of 2019 until earlier this year in 2023, and I believe he was hired by Joanne in 2016. We're going to talk a lot about him in a bit because, uh, I, guys, this is spicy stuff. This is spicy stuff. The company has been undergoing a strategic turnaround since 2016 with a focus on digital enhancement and a gain of making gains across uh, creative products. Okay, do, 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 do. All right, yeah. The company plans to use the proceeds from the offering to pay down its $72.8 million in outstanding borrowings under a second lien facility. All right, so this is what I found interesting about this article. By the way, I, I love this tweet. It's like at Joanne buying potato fabric. How maybe it's just me, but that seems very like taste specific. All right. All right. So this is interesting. This article again is from two years ago. And at this, at the time it said half of Joanne's store locations have been identified for a refresh over the next seven to 10 years. I'm going to guess most of these are not going to happen. Uh, I did go to a store that was one of the renovated stores. I'm going to guess a lot of these are not going to happen though. Joanne has four levels of store redesign costing $150,000 on the low end for a light refresh to $3 million for the most extensive revamps. Joanne has conducted 24 pilots uh, to devise this tiered plan. Uh, there were eight. Okay. And that's interesting too, because I remember seeing press. Joanne's occasionally puts out press releases on like cool new stuff they're doing. And one was like this, like, I remember one was like this sort of like innovative, like futuristic looking store. And I thought that was pretty interesting. Let me see if I can find that Joanne um, new store. So like it was like some new store concept. And yeah, I think, all right, I think we found it. So they'd opened up like a concept store or something. And it was like very like futuristic, very cool looking. All right, let me see if I can find, I want to find the press release. So, Cause remember seeing this, this was like in, tw this was like a few years ago. All right. I got to find this. Okay. And my store actually looks a little bit like this. This is the, uh, this is what they kind of wanted. 
You know, it's got like the cool looking store displays, very Instagram friendly. Got this little area to like hang out and make things, do like classroom stuff. Uh, this is the like custom shop where you can get your fabric cut. So again, they were trying to make it look kind of like hip and cool. Again, I don't think it's like a terrible idea to make like a better in-store experience. Obviously, these things cost um, a lot of money though, right? So these cost quite a bit of money. So I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how likely that is uh, to be. Okay, let's go back to this article though. Uh, so I think that's kind of what they were going for. And that obviously, I some of these stores are renovated, but a lot of them... A lot of you are saying that your store is not renovated. Okay, so this is the interesting thing that I found about the um, stock. All right, Leonard Green and Partners will own more than two-thirds of Joanne's stock once the company is public. Joanne is controlled by Leonard Green and Partners, and the firm will own 69% of the company's common stock once shares begin trading, meaning it will continue to make most of the decisions. As far as, as long as Leonard Green owns at least 50% of common stock, it can nominate up to five directors once the company is public. If it owns a small percentage, it can nom nominate fewer directors. Leonard Green would have to own 10% of shares or fewer to lose the ability to nominate at least one director. Accordingly, LGB, LGP can, currently controls the election of our directors and could exercise a controlling interest over our business affairs and policies, including the appointment of our management and the entering into of business combinations or disposi dispositions and other corporate transactions, the prospectus said. So this is interesting to me because, you know, you're always seeing things like, oh, well, they, they're beholden to shareholders. This company is beholden to shareholders. And in Joanne's case, they're beholden to this private equity firm, Leonard Green and Partners, because Leonard Green and Partners, at least in 2021, owned 69%. That's all, that's more than two thirds of Joanne's stock. So even though Joanne's was a publicly traded, is a publicly traded company and anyone can own the stock, this LGP private equity firm uh, still makes pretty much all of the decisions. They definitely have like, majority voting shares so they really still run the show so even though they put joann's up for sale on the public market you know they they still pretty much like own joann's they just use the ipo to raise like a lot of money so i thought that was pretty interesting all right let's take a look at okay so you're probably like okay what happened since then so 2021 they put the they put the stock up let's go back to the uh stock price okay so 2021 kind of held a little bit steady obviously goes down towards the end of the year goes up a bit in uh 2022 to 12 dollars um then joann's had an unexpected event and that was the sudden death of one of their executives which is executive vice president the chief financial officer or the CFO, Matt Sue. So this is a press release. Oh, sorry, guys. This is a press release Joanne put out on June 16th of last year, 2022, that Matt Sue's, uh, who had been with Joanne's. So this guy was with Joanne's for, um, let's see, like eight, like a long time, like over almost two decades. So this guy had been there for quite a while and he just, suddenly passed away. So in this press release, it says, uh, Joanne's current VP and controller, Tom Dreyer, will serve as interim chief financial officer that's controlling the money as the company begins its search for Suze's uh, successor. Okay, so Tom Dreyer then became the acting uh, CFO executive at Joanne's. So, all right, so we're up to 2022 in the timeline. I know this is taking a while, guys. There is so much, there's literally so much to get into though, that I'm like, oh my gosh. All right. So I was uh, looking around today before the show and then I saw this news. This news is literally today. This is breaking news, guys. Uh, Joanne's announced the termination of Tom Dreyer. That was the guy that was the acting CFO. He had officially been the VP and controller. Uh, so this guy was really only with the company. This guy, I don't even think was with the company that long. Uh, so Tom Dreyer has been terminated by Joanne's just in the past week. So he's one of the executives at the Hudson, Ohio headquarters that has been, you know, he's cut. He's gone. 
Tom is no more. Uh, he, his uh, termination was effective September 13th. Uh, he's getting restricted stock units, blah, 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 blah. So now the company, I don't even think the company has, does the company even have a CFO now? Let's check this out. Cause I don't think, yeah. Okay. Oh, so the chief financial officer is now, um, Scott Sakala. So the guy, that other guy, and here's the funny thing is that Tom, when I was checking the website the other day, I, I'm pretty sure Tom was on the website because there, there was like an, another person. So like, instead of having like two rows of four, there was like one additional person. So I'm pretty sure they just took off Tom. I, I'm pretty sure they just took Tom off the website. Uh, so Scott uh, is now the uh, chief financial officer, and he's also the co-interim uh, CEO. So there's a lot, like clearly there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of chaos going on at, at Joanne's right now. So that's um, what's going on with their leadership team. Um, now, we, we can't look at this. Now you're probably like, okay, so who's the guy that's been in charge from the IPO until almost now? And uh, that would be, he's still on the website. I'm guessing if people from Joanne see this after the show, they might uh, take this down. But uh, Wade Michelon, he, he still has a bio on the website. So Wade was the uh, chief executive officer or the CEO from 2019 until earlier this year. All right, so let's take a look at Wade. And Wade is the guy in the thumbnail. Now, I do want to be kind of careful. We're not going to speculate on Wade. Wade has a uh, a very interesting backstory, though, that we're going to be talking about because uh, Wade, yeah, Wade, it, I, I'm not, I'm kind of wondering how he got this job, like quite honestly. All right, so this is Wade. Wade is no longer with the company, but somehow his bio is still on the website. He was uh, appointed the CEO by the board of directors in February of 2019. Prior to that, he served as executive vice president, chief financial officer from 2016 and as interim president and CEO in October 18th until his position was made permanent. Uh, previously, uh, Michelon served as a CFO and executive vice president of Walgreens uh, Boots Alliance or the Walgreens company from 2009. Um, until I think he left shortly before he came to Joanne's. He also worked at uh, uh, Tyson Foods in 15 years as an executive at Procter & Gamble. And I think one of my former CNN colleagues went to work at uh, P&G too. It's, you know, I think they're also based, I want to say they also have a base in like Ohio. Uh, he's also a board member of Acadia Healthcare and a trustee of the National 4-H Council. He previously served on the boards of Alliance Boots, Lyric Opera, and uh, Chicago Sh Shed Opera. Now notice again, Wade has no previous experience with like crafting or sewing or anything like that. He worked at Walgreens. He worked at Procter & Gamble and Tyson Foods. So, you know, but but yet uh, the board picked him uh, to lead Joanne Fabrics, right? Okay, so he served for about, in that role for about four years little under four years. And in May of this year, Joanne put out a press release announcing his retirement. Now, let's look at the timeline here. May 9th of 2023. Let's look at the stock price here. And we're going to we're going to sort of compare this. So let's look at May. All right. So notice they announced his retirement around the time when the stock had gone under $2. Like this is not good. So he was CEO from the IPO until about here. So obviously the company is not doing very well. And clearly the board felt it was better. Uh, you know, and again, retirement, I don't know if, who knows how voluntary that is. So you're probably like, okay. Uh, so they announced his retirement. And I've also linked that in the, um, the uh, description box. So they announced that Chris DiTulio and Scott Sekula have been appointed to be the um, the interim CEOs. Um, and here's the other thing that I found from doing some of this research. Okay, so I want to show you, this is the document that Joanne's had to provide to the SEC or the Securities and Exchange Commission in order to file for this initial public offering. 
and I went through it. So it's, it's only four pages, but they do have to share how much all of these people make uh, in terms of compensation. So, oh, wait, sorry. So this is what they, so this is what they had to file. All right, let's take a look at, I want to go to a couple. All right. So let me share this instead. So this is what Joanne's had to share. Sorry, that was the wrong document. This is the document that Joanne's filed with the SEC for the IPO. Sorry, guys, I'm getting mixed up. I have way too many tabs here. Uh, so you see they've got the, uh, all of the, uh, they've got Wade as the CEO here. You've got the other folks involved, the lawyers and stuff. But um, when a company goes public and is publicly traded, they have to make their numbers um, publicly available for potential investors. Uh, but you got to see a lot of interesting info like uh, employee compensation. So let's take a look at that. Executive compensation. And by the way, this was kind of fascinating. So if you want to read this, you know, kind of a spicy read here. All right. So here's all of the, okay. So here, this is for, and also keep in mind, this is from 2021. So you've got Wade, uh, you've got Matt Sues, who is the CFO. This is the guy who passed away. Uh, Janet Duliga, Christopher DeTulio, and Robert Will. So here is what everyone made. All right, let's take a look at this. Okay, so, all right. So here is their base salary of all of these executives. So Wade made a base salary of $825,000, uh, Matt, $445,000. So the others are like four hundreds. And then here's all of like their, you know, additional compensation, all of that jazz when you're in the C-suite. And then here is, where's the total comp? Okay. All right, we guys, we got to take a look at the total compensation here. So this is how much these executives made in uh, total compensation uh, for 2000. Uh, okay, this is the fiscal year that ended in 2021. All right, so we got Wade here. Wade made $3.7 million for the 2021 fiscal year. Matt made $1.4 million. Janet made $1.37 million. So did Christopher. And then Robert made $1.3 million. So publicly, so again, we can see how much all of these executives made for uh, 2021. Okay, so I looked up, I also found this website, uh, salary.com. Now I believe what salary.com does is um, for every year, Joanne's has to file more paperwork with the SEC and share all of their executive compensation. So these numbers did match up what I saw on that, those official documents uh, from the SEC, right? So, all right, so let's take a look at 2021. And this is, and you can see the salaries for all of the executives here. Also, this is also also linked below. So you can see in 2021, um, yeah, this about matches. So total comp about $3.7 million uh, for Wade. But here's the thing, it gets it gets lower and lower. So 2022, sorry, this will take a second to load here. 2022, total comp for Wade Michelon, the former CEO, was $2.4 million. So obviously that reflects, you know, the company's decline. And then 2023, total compensation. So again, a little bit lower, $2.7 million. So obviously sales are not as good as they were in like 2020 and uh, 2021. Um, let me also, I found some other doc. Okay, so I'll show you this as well. So this is the form Joanne's had to file to talk about, um, to talk about Wade Mickle on the CEO leaving the company. So uh, Joanne had to file this to tell the SEC, hey, this guy's no longer with us. And they also had to detail um, how much they paid Wade Michelon as a uh, severance payout. Let me find, where is this? Let's see here. Okay, so under the separation agreement, when Wade quote unquote retired from Joanne, he was paid uh, $392,000 in a lump sum cash payment, um, you know, in return for him leaving the company. So I guess that's his golden parachute. Again, for for an executive, that seems like not cr a crazy amount, but for the average person like you and me, that's like a shitload of money. $392,000, that's more than I've ever made. Um, but, you know, but again, that's 
that, you know, that's like a quarter of the year salary for him, you know, quarter of the year's compensation for him or whatever. So anyways, let's take a quick break and I'm going to um, read some of your comments and then we will go, but, and then we are going to, we're going to get a little um, up close and personal with former CEO uh, Wade Michelon because whoo, there is a lot to talk about with Wade. Uh, I learned a lot about Wade. Sorry, my hair is going kind of crazy here. Uh, we learned a lot about Wade, and I really want to. Um, he's he's kind of famous for some other stuff, and I'm just really wondering at this point, like why the hell Joanne's decided to pick him as the CEO uh, with his history. Uh, his history was kind of interesting. All right, so let me. We'll, we'll go ahead. We'll read some. We'll read some of the chat, and then we will. Uh, We'll get back into, in, we'll, we're going to take a closer look at Wade Michelon. All right, we've got Karen here. I'm not a huge fan of Joanne Fabrics, uh, but it's the only fabric store in my area, so I hope they don't close. Yeah, I know, right? Me? I, you know, it is, uh, that's the thing. As much as we can crap on Joanne, like there are, we don't have a lot of options. So it's like, what do we, what do we do? All right, it's not me is here. Hi, Jen. That's such sad news. Joanne's has been around for as long as I can rem remember. I can't believe it's going the way of Sears and Bed Bath and Beyond. I know, right? All right, I wonder how this might affect their online classes. Creative Bug. I feel. I think Creative Bug is separate. I think Joanne's is like a, a some sort of partnership with them, but I don't think I don't think Joanne's like owns Creative Bug. I think it's separate. My store doesn't seem to have or have many in-store classes. All right, making new dreams come true. They don't look like crafters. I know, right? Carmen, hello. That explains why they try to push the ditto. They don't understand their customer. $300 is about right, not $800. All right, Michelle D in Florida. The Melbourne, Florida store hasn't had AC in months. Oh my God, really? Who? it... Florida is the hot, Florida is like the surface of the sun. You cannot survive in Florida without air conditioning. The poor employees had to work in that environment in the hottest summer months ever. Oh my, oh my gosh. I've got Dell here. I agree. They don't know anything really about crafts and how the crafts are constructed. No designers backgrounds. This is a joke. All right. We've got Temptation Terrier from Twitch. Thank you for watching on Twitch. All right, uh, 100, okay, have a good stream. All right, okay, all right, I think you are, uh, okay, this is sort of spam, but whatever, okay. Uh, making new dreams come true, says Michelle in Florida, that is terrible. All right, yes, all right, Carmen, MBAs don't necessarily need to work in or participate in crafting, they apply a cookie cutter approach to marketing. Yeah, and quite honestly, I think we can, that seems super obvious, um, but, you know, at the same time, though, obviously it's not really working for them because look at, I mean, look at the stock price. Look at what's, uh, look at what's going on. All right. Yeah. There is a lot more to Lockheed. Many divisions, not just, not just war. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I know. But it was, you have to admit that was funny to see someone go from Lockheed Martin to Joanne Fabrics. <laughs> I mean, you have to admit that is kind of comical. Elena says they don't care. All right, AS, it's been my experience that retail corporate high offices never hire anyone with actual store side experience. I do think that is a mistake. I think I think promoting from within and getting people who understand what it's like on the ground level at the stores would make a, a big difference. But they get these like Ivy League out of touch trust fund kids or whatever, or people who don't understand like regular people. All right, Dell Tolls, no one in the design industry, and it's all about money, what, what they can make. We don't want to hear their crap. They probably can't tell you how to thread a needle. Lol. I know, right? I know, I know. All right, and we got a, a we have a, a chat. Sorry, I do have some rumble chats as well. Uh, Steph says, this just cracks me up, makes me happy for mom and pop quilt shops. I'm hoping maybe that will, maybe the silver lining is that local uh, craft and sewing stores might get a boost or might be helped by this because some of these corporate places are not surviving. Okay, here we go. Uh, Carmen says, those are the folks who inject money into companies strapped for cash. Not surprised. Uh, you can't tell by their looks if they don't crap. You can't, but let's be real here. Let's be real. I, I think it's, I don't, I think I could win a bet if I had to guess how many of these people were really 
into crafting. I'm going to guess a lot of them probably don't know anything about it. All right. It's not me, says I'll be judgmental. Well, none are sewers or crafters. It's outrageous. That's what's calling the shots. Okay. They don't, they want return on investment and don't care what junk is sold. Uh, too much Chinese junk at Joann's. All right. All right. What state location not in Arizona for mask making or free material? A joke. All right. Worse than the board are Joanne employees who don't craft and don't know what is actually sold or the bad attitude uh, crew. All right. It's not me, says that's very cool. There, But there's no way I would have gone into one of their stores during a pandemic. Perhaps a home project would have worked. All right. Uh, very depressing. The people who are really going to hurt are the consumers and the hourly workers. They can go on to better positions. Uh, but the little has families to feed on their pay. Our, our right to severe, oh, severance pay from his contract. Yeah, he, hey, he got $392,000. That's uh, that's quite a lot. Elena says, a lot of corporate giants in Ohio. Hello, Jamie. Hello there. Thank you for watching. Private equity owners, how much in share do they each own and have sold off recently? I'm curious about that too. Uh, this is why companies die. Greedy executives, instead of taking those millions, it should have been invested in the company uh, to save it. Headhunters seek them out based on their strengths and are expected to perform. They are enticed by sweet deals. There is no customer or company loyalty. That died at least 15 to 20 years ago. Those executives don't get excited about fabric. I bet they don't have a single piece of fabric in their homes. Yeah, probably, you know, probably, I'm, yeah, I'm going to be a little judgy on that because I, I do think that's, uh, yeah, I'm going to guess most of these people don't know much about, um, mo I'm going to guess, going out on a limb here, that most of them don't really know anything about, uh, like, stuff we do. All right, so, now here's where we're at now. Um, well, actually, this article is from late last year, but um, even about a year ago, Joann's was put on a list of, uh, 18 real retailers at risk of bankruptcy as consumers tighten wallets in 2022. As demand wavers and capital gets harder to find, some could face default and bankruptcy, including last year's digital darlings. So I thought this was an interesting article from Retail Dive. And a lot of, I think, retailers are experiencing this from having a pandemic boon to having people who are cutting back on expenses and extra stuff. And, uh, jo and, and notice Bad Bath & Beyond is on this list and they clearly were affected. Also, like, I this makes sense to me. Rite Aid, Tuesday Morning, Wayfair, um, Party City. Do a lot of you guys really shop at Party City that often? Kirkland's, iMedia Express, The Real Real, Abercrombie & Fitch, Big Lots, uh, Stitch Fix, Thread Up, Torrid. And notice here, uh, credit Intel's top retailers at risk. And you can see right here, uh, Joanne. So Joanne, even last year, was put on the list of companies to watch for a bankruptcy. All right. So I was really curious about looking into uh, this ex-CEO, Wade Michelon, who, you know, kind of mysteriously stepped down in May of this year. And I wanted to know, like, I don't, I don't, you know, it's not like I really, most of us really don't know much about the CEOs of like large corporations. So I decided to do a little bit of a, a little bit of a deep dive. And I went down this rabbit hole and guys, I was, I was in here for hours last night. So here's Wade's Wikipedia page. And then we already looked at his Joanne bio. He's about 58. He went to Purdue University as an MBA. He is formerly of Joann's, Procter & Gamble, and Walgreens. And here's what I found kind of interesting. Also, um, guys, I found out like way, way too much information about this guy. I did find out like where he lives and stuff. I'm not going to be sharing that information um, just out of respect for privacy. Um, but I did learn that he does, he's a pretty well-off guy. He owns a very, very nice mansion in Ohio. But I don't think he lives there. I think he actually moved back to Chicago where um, it looks like he may be renting a very swanky place uh, in Chicago. But I did find his his address in Ohio. 
Uh, again, and it, and it kind of tracks because it one, it's close. He's listed as the owner on the property for one. Um, he's not listed. So in most areas, this is all, by the way, guys, I'm like a super online stalker. If I really wanted to stalk people all day, I'm very good at it just because of, uh, I had to do it a lot in news. So this is something I was, I was just used to doing. So I know it seems a little creepy. Maybe it is. Uh, but I'm able to find a lot of information on people. Let's just let's just leave it at that. But I did find the property he owns. Uh, this is like a multi-million dollar mansion, guys. This is not like your modest single family home. But he does not live there because he doesn't get like the home. He's Typically, you can tell if the person lives there because it, it's whether they or not they get like that homestead exemption through the county. Um, and it looks like he doesn't really live there. But I also, this is as weird as it gets, but um, I found a video of him online where he was like doing a Zoom interview, like with people. And the background of his the room he was in actually matches photos I found of the house. So that's how I, I was like, yeah, this is definitely his place here. All right. So Wade worked at Walgreens from 2008 um, until 2014. And this is what I found pretty interesting. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes Wikipedia uh, is not always factually correct. So what I do is down at the bottom, you can always check out the sources that whoever, you know, updated the info used. Uh, so I did look, I did make sure all of this checked out. So do you guys remember that uh, company Ther Th Theranos and that woman, Elizabeth Holmes, who was supposed to be like a super genius, like the next, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or the next you know, Steve Jobs, and she ended up, um, her company had promised that you could take a single drop of blood and you would be able to um, use this machine she developed in proprietary technology uh, to test one drop of blood for like a ton of different things. And it turned out all of this was totally fake. She was a complete fraud. She is now in prison um, and there, there's been like a couple documentaries about her in movies. Well, it turns out that um, Wade here, Wade Michelon, who Joanne's hired as uh, the CEO, Wade was actually duped by Elizabeth Holmes of, Ther of Theranos. So this is actually true. All right. So Wade, so Wade was involved in the acquisition of e-commerce company drugstore.com. Uh, the purchase of New York City drugstore chain Dwayne Reed, by the way, awesome drugstore, um, and two-step transaction to acquire and merge with Alliance Boots. He, along with other executive leadership, was also involved in the development of a partnership with the blood testing company Theranos. Like everyone she lied to, he continued to support uh, Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes even after the Wall Street Journal exposed the company as a fraud. Referring to Theranos critics as haters and claiming she was going to help so many people in her lifetime it's absurd it's absurd in the dropout a 2022 hulu mini series about theranos uh, mccullen is portrayed by actor josh pace he left walgreens in 2014 and filed a defamation lawsuit over media reports of being pushed out due to miscalculating and earnings forecast so he was the cfo of walgreens and yeah, he was he was one of the Walgreens executives that was duped by Elizabeth Holmes. So I was like, holy crap. Okay, so let me look at this. Okay, let's... Uh, all right, let's take a look at this. All right, oh, here's the... Guys, we have a lot of stuff to get through here. A lot of stuff to get through. All right, so I wanted to kind of do my... I Guys, I looked at so many articles for this thing. All right, so here is a C. Oh, this is NBC Bay Area, so that's San Francisco. A former Walgreens executive, this is Wade Michelon, who was the Joanne CEO, testifies in Elizabeth Holmes' fraud trial. So here is the story here. Um, let's see here. Talked about pressure to move quickly and get the blood testing machines into stores. Do, do, do. Okay, he testified that Walgreens planned to eventually put mini labs in all of its stores uh, to let customers get tested. Uh, Michelin said they chose Ther Theran sorry, I cannot pronounce uh, Theranos because they were led to believe it was the safest for the furthest along in testing, admitting he knew other companies, including Safeway, were also were interested in uh, the Theranos machine. So there was pressure 
uh, to move fast. Here's the funny part too. So here's an article from the Wall Street Journal. This is this is more of like a hit piece on him, to be honest. Uh, former Walgreens CFO rally behind. Here's my thing too. So like Joanne, the this private equity group, uh, L LGP, they knew about this history and they still had no problem appointing Wade Mickel on the CEO. So he basically got a promotion and got a better job after this like debacle. So that's what I found kind of crazy. Uh, former Walgreens CFO rallied behind Holmes. Haters are everywhere. Two of this week's witnesses testified that at one point they had admiration and a fondness for Elizabeth Holmes. Former Safeway CEO Stephen Bird said he found the Theranos Inc. founder to be smart and charismatic and awed by how much she owned the room when she spoke. Wade Michelon, a former finance chief at Walgreens Boots Alliance Inc., testified that Ms. Holmes made an impression on him such that he continued to be her fan and friend even after Ther Theranos' problems were exposed. Mr. Michelon said in court testimony that he stayed in touch with Ms. Holmes after his departure from Walgreens in the summer of 2014. So this is about two years before he was hired at Joann's. Uh, text messages that he sent to her, which were displayed in court, were flattering and encouraging even after media investigations had begun to explode, expose a Theranos' technological challenges. In late October 2015, wow, so that's even like right before he got the Joann's job, about two weeks after the Wall Street Journal published its first story about Theranos' shortcomings and misleading claims about its technology, Mr. McKellen emailed Ms. Holmes to encourage her to keep her chin up. Keep in mind, this lady was convicted on some very serious crimes about fraud and everything, and she's now in prison. All right. In an apparent reference to the journal story, Mr. McKellen wrote, the haters are everywhere, but your contribution to the world cannot be bottled up. The universe is an odd way of preparing very special people for the even bigger missions ahead. He wrote in a second email, you are going to help so many people in your lifetime. It's absurd. Don't lose sight of that. He closed the email. I'm so very proud to be your friend. Keep rocking and keep being you. So this is the guy that Joanne's chose to be in charge. So, I mean, while he did not commit a crime and it seems like a lot of people were indeed duped by Elizabeth Holmes. Here's the thing, like, wouldn't that kind of call into question this person's judgment if they're going to be duped by some woman who's a total fraud? And here's the thing, she never actually had a working uh, machine to show them. So that's sort of weird. You know what I'm saying? That, that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. So I, I just find this whole thing a little, a little strange um, that choice for um that this would be their choice for a joanne ceo i don't know just i i would maybe have i would maybe find this a little bit um questionable and here's the funny thing too is that um wade michelon was per here's like an article about the dropout series on hulu and the walgreens guys now i have not seen the series but from what i was seeing these guys are portrayed as like morons. Like they're basically, you know, made out to be like Id complete idiots who are just duped by Elizabeth Holmes. It's not a, like it's a funny portrayal, but it's not flattering. So this is, this guy right here with like the, ooh, look on his face is supposed to be Wade uh, Mikulon. So I was like, that's, so they kind of portray Wade as like an idiot. You know what I'm saying here? So I thought that was kind of, just kind of funny. Um, Another thing that is in Wade's past is, um, and again, now I'm not going to say this should, I'm not going to say this should like automatically rule him out from employment or anything like that. But um, uh, Wade Michelon has been arrested not once, but twice for DUI. So driving under the influence. Um, and there have been many reports about this. So again, this is in uh, Cook County. So Within the past, okay, this is from 2010, so it has been a while, but he has been arrested and he was, um, now here's the thing, being arrested and being charged are different than being convicted. And so, and this is in his Wikipedia bio, again, backed up by sources, uh, that Wade does have a history of getting uh, multiple, multiple DUIs. So, you know, maybe in the past, this guy appears to maybe 
have a drinking problem. Just saying here. Again, I will point out though, just for um, just for clarity's sake, in at least in the 2010 arrest. Now, this is a paywalled article. He did have a trial in the DUI, and he was found not guilty. Again, I'm sure he had the best lawyers and everything. Uh, but I do want to clear. I do want to just clarify that uh, even though he was arrested for two DUIs, he actually was not found guilty of the DUI. So again, you know, I, sometimes with these stuff like this, um, often people who are charged with like violations like this can get charges like dropped. They got good lawyers. They might plead to something lower, or you know, they can have a trial like this. So. Um, just because someone is arrested of a crime does not mean they're actually guilty of a crime. There is a pretty significant difference. Uh, so that's why the Wikipedia page just says he was arrested for DUIs, but it looks like he, he was able to kind of get out of those charges. Uh, so that is, that, that is something to, to bear in mind. But again, I, I would say a lot of these things like adding up in the total package here, like just don't really give me a good impression of this guy, to be honest with you. But I also kind of want to be factual and not, you know, speculate. These are the facts. These, you know, I'm not, you know, trying to say he's a bad guy or anything. Also, he, um, he clearly is very lawsuit happy because he, he's filed some outlets for defamation uh, for claiming that he um, had some miscalculations while Walgreens. Uh, here is a an interview he had with CNBC in uh, this was in, I think, like 20, like 19, maybe. And he is talking here. He is just talking about the uh, the tariffs um, that some of their goods faced. Um, so I just found all of these uh, the background of Wade to be kind of interesting. Uh, I just find him to be kind of an intro. I'll just say an interesting choice for CEO. Uh, so I will leave it at that. But I did just want to pre present you with all of the um, you know just just all of the the attributable facts surrounding uh, Wade Michelon. All right, so let's look at, all right, here's another article about the uh, retirement. So again, so Wade was there for about four, no, all right, so Wade was technically in the position at Joanne's, let's see, he was officially the CEO for about four years. Uh, so here's an article about Joanne CEO exits the company after a challenging year. All right, Joanne president and CEO Wade Michelon retired Monday, according to a company press release. Uh, Chief Customer Officer Chris DiTulio and Chief Financial Officer Scott Sekula will lead the interim office of the Chief Executive Officer. Joanne's board has begun a search to identify a permanent replacement. Okay, so he was with the company officially seven years, but he was only the CEO technically for four. Uh, started at Joanne as CFO, appointed interim CEO in 2018, took top position in February 2019. Uh, his retirement comes after what Michelon called a challenging fiscal 2023. In the company's most recent earnings report, um, full year net sales declined by 8.3% to $2.2 billion. Uh, comp sales declined 8.1%, and the company reported a net loss of $201 million compared to a net income of $56.7 million the previous year. Although a CEO change seemed inevitable, it adds a layer of uncertainty to the company, according to a Wells Fargo and analyst note regarding uh, McKellen's retirement. While a search for a replacement is underway, we, we see benefits to a quick resolution. The analysts, led by David Lance, wrote, pointing to declining comps, margins, and category demand, liquidity concerns, and a post-IPO underperformance. That's an understatement because the IPO has been a total fail. All right. On behalf of the board, I'd like to thank Wade for leading Joanne through its initial public offering and the difficult challenges the COVID-19 pandemic presented. Brian Coleman, Vice President at Leonard Green Partners, said in a statement, As we look to the next chapter for Joanne, we remain focused on delivering value for our shareholders through strategic priorities, centered on creating a great in-store and online experience for our customers driving operational efficiencies and capitalizing on Joanne's strength in the sewing arts and crafts categories. Guys, is it just me or does it seem like this was written by chat GPT? The retailer saw a surge in sales during the height of COVID-19. While people worked on projects at home and easing of pandemic restrictions and an increase in inflation, which led to a pullback on discretionary spending impacted the retailer. Woo, let me take a quick water break here.
In March, the company entered into a $100 million first in last out facility to provide additional liquidity and optimize the company's balance sheet. The company also announced a $200 million annual cost reduction plan. So that's kind of what, what's going on now. A goal it expects to realize by fiscal year 2025. Uh, freight and inflationary challenges remain, visibility is low, and the category is highly promotional discretionary. Wells Fargo analysts said McKellen's retirement, therefore, is concerning uh, to an already deeply challenged business. Joanne was placed on Retail Dive's bankruptcy watch list next fall. So that brings us into the present, which is what the hell is going to happen at Joanne's? Are they going to close stores? Are they going to file for bankruptcy? Are they going to be able to get it together? Um, you know, will the company maybe maybe it will be taken off the IPO and be taken private? Will maybe another company buy it? I, I don't know. It's really hard to speculate, uh, but I think it's pretty clear. It seems like the writing is on the wall for Joanne, and it's not looking good. Like all of these things put together, uh, it's pretty easy to see that things are are really not going well for uh, Joanne's. All right. So, all right. And here's the funny thing is that Joanne's literally just put out this press release saying that allegedly they're going, I don't know how they're going to do this. They're planning to hire 5,000 more team members to help customers create a handmade holiday with everything like spiraling. I just don't, I really don't know how this is possible. This seems, this just, yeah, I don't, this just seems like a terrible idea. And like, do they even have the money for this? It seems like things are not going very, very well. So I, I don't know. I honestly, I'm like, what? Yeah. I'm like, I don't. Yeah. So that's where we are now. That brings us up to speed uh, with the present. Let's take a look at some of your uh, comments here. All right. All right, we got Elena here. Joanne wants customers to shop online or pick up at the store after ordering online to get the discount. Very understaffed. They don't want customers in the stores. It's probably safe assumption. They prefer online sales. Uh, looks like sales-driven compensation. Yes. All right, yes, bad blood. Oh, I like this. This is like very undercover boss here. They should have to work in a store. Yes, please get your hands on Undercover Boss. Oh my gosh. Okay. All right. I'm not sure what this OMG ripped off with George Schultz. Amazing. That's an incredible story. And the book Bad Blood is one you can't put down. All right. I stopped. Oh, wait. I stopped going to Joanne's and go to my local quilt shop. Hey, cool, cool, cool. All right. The wealthy definitely protect their own. Yes. Thing. Like, I feel like a lot of these people who are getting canned, they're just going to like float off to their next job and get a better C-suite position and continue to make a lot of money. Uh, food, gas, craft supplies, which goes first from the budget. Yeah, exactly. You're, it's going to be like your subscriptions, your extra stuff, you know, your like dinners out, that sort of thing, you know, you know, because we need to like that's and we need we need to eat, you know, we need to eat. CEOs make banks. So why the surprise about his home? I'm not surprised about his home. I just kind of wanted to, I just wanted to dig into it. Plus I'm just like nosy like that. So, Hey, uh, that's just tells me he works like a fiend and has no life. Their life is their job. I do think he's, it looks like he's married and has kids. So he does. And I think it looks like he met his wife at uh, Procter and Gamble. Cause I looked up the wife and the wife also used to work at Procter & Gamble. They're just like those Ivy League types, though, so that's kind of, they roll together. Um, so lovely with Grace. Local quilt shops don't carry much apparel fabric. That is a bummer. Um, and that's the thing. With the closing of Fabric.com, that made it hard for us, too, because what we couldn't find at, like, Joann's, often we could get it at Fabric.com. All right, let's see here. We've got, all right, this is about Theranos. It's a startup that, Overpromised. It's, it's exciting to bring in a new technology, so I'm not surprised. Yeah, right. People were just really dazzled with her, and she got had that like weird, gravelly, fake voice. Like that's the thing. I remember reading articles about her like years ago. Like here's the thing about um. Here's also the thing about the dangers of just blindly believing media coverage. 
I saw so many, I saw a ridiculous amount of puff pieces and TV pieces about Elizabeth Holmes. And I feel like a lot of these journalists just took everything at face value without questioning it. And until that expose that the Wall Street Journal did, like people just believed her. Because I remember reading and thinking, oh, that's like she was in Time Magazine. I remember reading and seeing media coverage on her that was just glowing, very non-critical and just total puff pieces. And nobody, nobody thought to be like, does this even work? Because I remember thinking that is a really cool technology that you can like, I'm terrified of needles. So the idea of just having because I remember reading like I think a Time Magazine article and thinking if I could just give one drop of blood and not have to get my blood drawn, that would be so much less traumatic for me because I'm just terrified of needles. Uh, but apparently it's all like a total lie. All right. Uh, they should hire more workers and cut useless overpaid leadership. It looks like they're starting to do that, but it may be like too late. I don't know. Maybe that's why he wound up at Joanne's. He lost his bona fides in his industry. Chris, yeah, that's the thing. Like, is Joanne's considered like a like a crap? I, like, you know what I mean? Is this like a lower prestige job? CEO of any company is still okay, right? I don't know. All right. Do, do, do. I don't know. Remember Biden toured her fake lab? I'll have to look that up. I don't know. I remember seeing a lot of coverage of her lab. Let's see here. Uh, Biden tour. Here's the thing. She had every, she had like, um, she had like ex, um, like cabinet members on her like board. Like she had a lot of social proof. Like it's like the, um, it's like that, um, F FTX stuff. Like, you know, if you have a Super Bowl ad and you have all these like, prominent people promoting something it's I, I can see it's pretty easy to get like sucked into stuff okay okay he did apparently president biden actually did oh boy 2015 by oh okay you're right biden so again if even the president can be um fooled by this woman like i i do think that says something if even the current president was like tricked by elizabeth holmes Okay, he did tour the lab in 2015. Oh boy, oh boy. Okay. All right, uh, leadership should include sewists and crafters. You would think, I think for the success of a business like Joanne's, you, you should at least have somebody who knows anything about it to, to like know what's going on here. You know what I mean? All right, George Schultz was a secretary of state. Cool, cool, cool. Um, okay, so that's... Um, that's so we went over by the way if you are watching this on the replay we just went over like a recap of what's happening with joanne's all of the leadership structure we looked into the most recent ceo wade michelon and his ties to the very failed fraudulent startup theranos which by like i just want to know what were what was this private equity company thinking hey here's the guy that got totally fooled by this fraudster let's hire him to be the ceo you know, I just, I, I got some questions. I got some questions here. Um, all right. I think they should do a team building craft class. I feel like these people should at least know, know a little bit about the craft, like crafters or like sewing. If you're going to sell, if you're going to sell fabric and stuff, um, you know, I, I feel like it's gonna, either way, it's going to be a fail. You're setting yourself up for failure. If you have zero people on your leadership team, you know, shit about crafting. Just my, uh, just my opinion here. Just my opinion. All right. So I did want to read you guys some. Okay. Let's see. Do, do, do. All right. So I've got, I got a few messages, by the way. Um, if you're watching this later, by the way, um, if Joanne's people or Wade Michelon, if you're watching this stream somehow in the universe and you'd like a chance to say your piece, you're welcome to come on Sewing Report Live. I can't promise you a cakewalk interview, but if you are willing to do a live conversation, I'm willing to have it. Nothing pre-taped though, and everything needs to be on the table. But if you would like to come on and, you know, say what you want to say, you know, reach out to me. You can leave a comment here on this live stream, or you can DM me on Instagram. I'm at Sewing Report. And uh, hey, DMs are open for you, Wade Michelon, from your from your swanky place in Chicago. You're welcome to, to. I see you got access to Zoom or whatever. 
you're welcome to come on and chat about your, if you want to air the dirty laundry about Joanne and you're not under an NDA, so you can talk about it or um, yeah, you're welcome to come on. Um, also, if you are a current or former employee and you want to send a news tip or let me know about something going on, uh, DM me on Instagram. You can stay anonymous. I will not uh, share your name or any identifying information, but I did have a manager reach out to me and um, provide. Okay, so he, this is from a uh, someone in management at a Joanne store. By the way, thank, you know who you are. Thank you very much. I'd like to keep, I, again... All right, so this uh, current employee, uh, okay, so this is what they say. I'm going to read this off my phone. Um, okay, it's the it's the floor managers, key holders who had their full-time status taken away uh, to part-time along with a pay cut to match the part-time pay. So it's just the store manager and assistant store manager who are full-time employees at all stores. A coworker of mine who was affected by this inquired with HR about the payout and HR refused to disclose anything. That's about the severance package. Yes, hours have been cut for everyone. And I've been having to manage the store during the closing shift with just me and the cashier, two staff from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. And we still need to make sure to get all of our closing chores done and somehow keep an eye out for shoplifters. It gets rough. Uh, one thing I took notice of was more than half the store employees at the location I work in are put under as casual team member, which means they don't get the annual uh, 10 to 20 cent raise. And I can swear there were only about two to three employees who were considered casual team members from the last time I looked into it a few months back. So that's kind of interesting. So when we were looking at job listings in the last show, I, I noticed a bunch of job listings that said casual team members. Um, and what the, this manager is saying that that means it's like a part-time employee no benefits, and they're not eligible for any raises. So they're being hired in like at or very close to minimum wage. All right. Um, I also asked, I said, hey, these pay cuts, I said, hey, these pay cuts must be pretty like demoralizing for everybody. And they said the motivation to work for the former full-timers is low, and I can't blame them for being that way at work. Uh, they also said, okay, so I said, I asked them, I said, if, if there was anything you wanted to say, uh, to Joanne corporate leadership, what would you want to tell them? Uh, they said, give back the full-time status for those who had it taken away. I feel for those who had worked there for how many years and they get done dirty like this. It was a big slap in the face and they showed how much they didn't appreciate the very people who work in the store. All right. So I, I can imagine the morale at Joanne's must be, must be pretty low right now. So if you are trying to shop there, uh, one, I would... One, it, apparently it's been hard for them to answer the phone, so I can't even recommend you call them because uh, it doesn't sound like they have the bandwidth to answer phones with all everything else that's going on. A lot of stores seem to have like very sporadic hours because they just don't have enough employees. But I would also ask that you um, be very patient with the people working there. Clearly, there's a lot going on and it's not their fault. So, okay. Um, and I also asked, I said, why do you think uh, Joanne appears to be on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, they said, my opinion, they rode on their high horse during the pandemic and expected it to go on forever. Uh, the first year I worked at the store, I've seen prices on quilting cotton go up two times on different occasions. Insane. Yes, they go on sale, but it's not as if they're on sale all day every week. Uh, my opinion, if they're going to cut costs, uh, they should have cut salaries of those who got paid the most up top. Uh, not the actual people who get paid hourly. So this is from a manager. They also said, um, I said, do you, I also was talking to them because my impression from Joanne's is that the inventory now is like really weird. Like they have a lot of stuff that doesn't seem to belong in a Joanne fabrics. Um, and they said, I said the same. We don't even get so much fabric during freight days. A majority of what comes are seasonal decor and things in between. I was surprised to unbox caboodle cases this last week. It's all weird. So caboodle cases, they were very popular in the 90s and they're coming back. There are these like cosmetics. They're plastic cosmetic cases. They kind of look like fishing tackle boxes, if you know what I mean. Um, I'll try to show one to you. But apparently this is now like priority at Joann's to sell like caboodles. Let me look it up. Caboodles, cases. And... Uh, that does seem a little strange for okay yeah here's it here it is at joann's now let's take a look see 
<clears throat> so Joanne Fabric, a fabric and craft store, is now selling, and again, this is like for cosmetics and stuff, a caboodle petite carrying case with mirror. So again, it kind of like you open it up and there's like a little like um like pull-out tray inside. They come in fun colors. Again, I'm not knocking the product or anything. They're cool. Like this just doesn't make a lot of sense for a, like a Joanne fabric. Um, and they also have a lot of other stuff that I'm like, why, like, why, why is this here? All right. I also said, I also asked like what happens to the merchandise uh, that doesn't sell. And they said merch that doesn't sell at our store. The store manager donates them to local boys and girls clubs and other nonprofits. Uh, the only merch we do throw out are old outdated sewing patterns, magazines, and food. Um, so thank you very much for the employee uh, that DM'd me. If you are also a Joanne's employee, I would love to hear from you. Uh, DM me. There we go. DM me. Wait, pointing the wrong way. DM me. Wait, I'm really pointing the wrong way. DM me on Instagram. Um, and let me know what's going on. Or if you have any like news tips you'd like me to hear about, I'm happy to uh, look into them. Or if you have any like insider information, I definitely plan on doing some follow-up shows uh, to update you on whatever, because I feel like we're going to get some updates. There's been like updates pretty frequently uh, from corporate. So I'm just really, I'm really surprised. Okay. All right. So let's read some more comments. All right. Uh, put leadership on the floor behind the cutting counter for a week as part of their training. That'd be interesting. Okay. So you did the math. This is interesting. So um, 855 stores, 5,000, that's about 5.84. 5 that's not too bad. Here's the thing though. Like this company is spiraling so quickly. Like even that, here's the thing. They don't even have, like, they might not even have six employees per store now. Like that's, that still seems, that still seems like a lot to me. I, I would say like, that seems like not much, but to a company that is eliminating most of their full-time positions, um, that still seems, that still seems like it's going to be a significant expense for the company. It all adds up, even the part-time workers that are making minimum wage. Uh, the store workers make the sales, not the overpaid leadership. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Sarah says, friend used to work there. My store no longer has a worker for freight to unload new shipments with the forklift lift. Everything in the store is just still on the floor. Oh, still on the box, not on the floor. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds about right. Uh, Karen says, I remember the caboodle case from the 80s. Yeah, they were like... I, I had one and I loved it. I kind of want another one. Me too. I had the sparkling blue caboodle for you. Caboodles are awesome, aren't they? Uh, her store was also down to two shopping carts. Oh my God. And had to wait months to get new carts. She left when the cut happens. Well, I hope your friend is doing well. I It does seem like if you are still at Joanne's, you may want to be uh, looking for other options. I'll just say that because... Um, some of the, the whisperings I'm seeing on this Joanne subreddit are, are not, are not good. Um, all right. Love your show. Very informative. Thank you. And by the way, um, just a quick favor to ask if you are kind of coming in late and everything, um, a couple things I do want to share from my perspective about doing, uh, content like this online. It is, even though you're like, oh, she's just turning on her camera and doing a live stream. Shows like this, especially stuff with a lot of resources, guys, I have like 30 Google Chrome tabs open, like 30. I had to research for hours because I wanted to try to get this as correct as I could. Um, you know, and I still might make mistakes from time to time. That's how life goes. But um, doing even a show like this requires hours and hours of preparation. And also there's like the YouTube specific stuff. There are technical aspects to it. Um, so in order to do this, a significant amount of resources are required on my part. Um, so it's, these are not easy sh shows to produce. So if you can, one thing to help me out, if you're here and you haven't already, go ahead and hit that like button. If you are finding this to be valuable content and you uh, would like to see more of it. Also, you're welcome to subscribe to Sonya Report Live. I do plan on doing a lot more like industry updates on whatever is going on. Um, I did a lot with Cricket, And I also want to point out that um, this, like situations like this are exactly why it's important to have independent content creators like myself 
who do not have a lot of sponsors. Now, the reason why is because if I had a business partnership with Joann's, I would not be able to be doing this live stream because most of these companies require their influencers to sign uh, or agree to some sort of non-disparagement clause, meaning I can't say anything bad about the company. So while you can make a lot of money getting sponsorships and partnerships with big companies, uh, the downside is that if if something happens and there are there is um, more critical news to report on these companies, a lot of people are kind of forced into the position where they can't speak about it. Um, but because I'm pretty independent, I'm able to I'm able to talk freely. I'm able to criticize some of the company. Again, I'm not trying to shit on Joann's here. I like Joann's. I shop at Joann's. I have nothing personal against Joann's. I'm doing these shows because uh, they're important and because I, I feel like we all deserve to know this information. Um, so that is the, there are definitely upsides and downsides to like the whole influencer content creator space. But I do want to emphasize um, situations like this are why it's very important to have more independent creators who might not necessarily have all of these corporate sponsors or big time brand sponsors, because the people who do are very limited um, in talking about that company besides anything that's not 100% positive. So um, subscribing to this channel really helps. I am trying to get monetized. I need 1,000 subscribers. I'm about 150 away, so I'm very close. That would really help. Even if I could just get this one monetized, it would definitely make this type of programming um, more doable. I would be able to do more of it. Um, also, this, uh, this live stream is, again, sponsored by... The Sewing Report Etsy shop for all of your fabric and sewing supplies needs. I've also recently started selling a few handmade items I'm dabbling. So again, if you would like to support this type of work um, and you don't want to see it go away, again, you all know um, finding good journalism, finding good quality uh, reporting is pretty difficult. Um, look, I know I used to work in the media industry. It's freaking hard. Um, there's not, you know there there's a lot of conflicts of interest and uh, you know this is kind of an area where um you know you're not going to see your mainstream networks reporting on the inner workings of joanne fabrics besides just like the surface level stuff like if joanne's for you know hypothetically were to like close uh you would see some media coverage on that but it would be very surface level and it would not be anything like this they're not going to look into the ceo they're not going to look into what's happening at each individual store. Um, so this is why independent media is very important. And I just, you know, just a quick PSA that it is pretty difficult. Um, it's difficult to sustain this type of content because uh, there's not a lot of money in it. Um, so that's why direct support is very critical for, for stuff like this. Uh, all right, let's read some of your comments here. All right. Thank you, Vanessa. Vanessa says, this was a very informative report. Yeah, guys, I spent like all day yesterday working on this and part of the day today. So I really wanted to try to get this um, accurate. But man, the stuff I learned about Wade Michelon, holy shit, that was, I had no idea. I didn't know his backstory, but that was pretty crazy. And I'm just really surprised that he was the pick for, to lead Joanne. Um, yeah, I don't know. All right, maybe a good time to stock up on fabric. Yeah, I would say that might be a good time here. Thank you very much. All right, Carmen says, I made three quilts 20 years ago. The mode of fabric from the quilt store is still in good condition. Uh, the Joanne's quilt fabric fell apart as it disintegrated. I would, okay, you're saying you wouldn't stock up on the fabric. Are you fair enough? Or right, maybe for like less, um, like maybe for like more household whatever projects then I guess. All right, uh, F Pixel says it's good to make the community aware about the business we've been spending our money on exactly. And here's the thing: this is Joanne's is like the big dog in our space, and if they're in trouble, that's going to impact a lot of people. So that's the thing: like the the wide level of interest about what's going on at Joanne's, I felt was very important. So that's why I've been spending a lot of time dedicated to um, doing these live streams for you. I am seeing some other rumors too, so. I'm going to be keeping an eye out for the latest. If you have any news tips, so DM me 
at Sewing Report. If you are working at Joanne's or if you know anything, I would love to hear from you and see like what um, what's going on. All right, we got another Rumble comment as well. All right, we've got Amelia. Thank you for tuning in. I just tuned in. This would explain why Joanne uh, was selling a tailor, Sam, that melts when you try to iron on the cotton setting. Oh, yikes. It never occurred to me to check the fabric content when I bought it for real. Yikes. Okay, that's, uh, yeah. So maybe, maybe, maybe the buyers at Joann's, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe not so good. I don't know. That's, yeah, the qual. maybe they, some of the products, I would say the, the quality level is a little bit, a little bit iffy there. Some of the stuff is fine. I don't know. But when I was there, I was kind of like, are these corporate buyers on like crack or something? Because like none of the inventory made sense. They've got like way too much of that novelty fleece. They've got a floral department that I feel is like very taste specific. And they got the custom framing department that I never really see anybody using. They sell the most random things. They've got like candy. They got snacks. They sell like commuter coffee mugs. They are selling like um, teeny, like the beanie babies. They've got all of this like very, very taste specific and very quickly to be dated seasonal home decor. Like it seems like they could really par down the supplies. And also I, I would love to see them getting like maybe fewer, but like higher quality supplies, higher quality fabric. Um, like I think the Liberty fabric was actually like a step in the right direction, stuff like that. I also saw they had like some new fabric lines, like they were selling like Eddie Bauer fabric and Juicy Couture fabric. So I thought that was pretty, um, pretty interesting. Karen says, a users for Joann's just look like a cheap, cheap crap, very cheap fabric. You know, yeah, that's 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 fair enough. All right, let's look at some of the, um, I was looking at some of your comments. Um, by the way, thank you to everyone that was commenting on like Instagram and um, YouTube. I will be reading your comments uh, today as well. So thank you for that. All right, let's take a look. See, hold on a second. I got to refresh real quick. All right. Uh, Karen says they are trying to compete with Hobby Lobby for the home decor. That is all crap. I would agree. I just don't see a lot of value for the seasonal home decor. Oh, buyers. Okay. Buyers for Joann's. Okay. You mean like the corporate buyers, not like buyers like us, but the people that select the merchandise that go into the stores. I know it can be a little, a little confused. All right. Let's read some of the Instagram comments real quick. Um, and then we'll go back to some of the live chat. But I appreciate everyone tuning in. Uh, but I did want to kind of shout out everyone who left a comment. Uh, so these are some folks that are reporting what's happening at uh, what's happening at their Joanne stores. All right. So this is my Instagram post. Uh, Real Housewife Rachel says, Ugh, I went to a store that isn't my regular store last week, and it was so sad and quiet, barely anybody working. My regular store seems to be doing fine, though. All right. Not an average quilter. They closed two stores near me just before and during the pandemic. When I go into the other stores in my area, they're disheveled, poorly stocked, and staffed even worse. Something needs to change. Organic Fabric Company. Shop small and local. Joanne stores are constantly putting shops like mine out of business. With their unsustainable pricing, I employed more people in my little 800-square-foot shop than the average Joanne store does. Oftentimes, people argue that large chains employ more people than smaller local counterparts. In, may ca in many cases, this is true. Uh, but with Joann's, uh, not, this is rarely, if ever, the case. Or I need some more water real quick. Shop Trafty Crazy says, might also be restructuring to better accommodate online ordering and pickup, like how Starbucks has changed so much since they started doing that. I'm going to heart your comment here. Uh, so much to love says, this makes me sad. I hope they don't start closing stores. Um, I should say more stores. A small Joanne's store near me closed a couple years ago, but we have a large one in a, in a neighboring town. I do feel like I never see very many employees there, but the store is usually busy. Uh, so Silvery Joe says, oh, damn, this is sad. Uh, Tis so sweet. So sad. My local store usually only has two employees. Uh, it's very, very rare that there's three. Original Sheltie Mom. So in your port, wow, this is a surprise to me. We were just there yesterday and things were normal. Three working, the fabric cutting table, wow. And a couple of employees checking out. That's pretty, uh, you got a gem of a store there. Saw a few employees walking around as well. We are in Texas. All right, 58 Holly. The store I go to in South Carolina, Greenville, has always seemed to operate with low staff. 
So sad if they go even lower. Uh, the store has not been the same, though, since the pandemic. I just don't even go in as much as I used to because the merchandise is not as robust and inviting as it used to be. I feel like the supply chain is broken and large, beautiful metropolitan areas are getting the best merchandise. Thank you, Jen, for staying on top of all the crafting and sewing news. I am 60 years old and I want to I want you to know that I appreciate your news. I'm sure you want the younger crowd. No, we want everybody here. Uh, but I do like that you keep me informed. We I'm welcome. We welcome everyone here, whoever you are. All right, Patty Mac makes. Um, let's see. I have not been to my local store in months. I have not had time to sew this summer, but I've also shifted away from Joanne except for a few items here and there. My friend in California near Oakland reports two stores closing there. Ooh. Trisha's Beach House. I love these usernames. I went to my store in Maryland this past week and was surprised to see just one staff on the sales floor. Not one of the usual employees were there. I'm very sad about this. So a lot of you are reporting some like weird stuff happening at the stores. That's interesting. Dearly Discipled, in early August 2023, Joanne and Brandywine, Maryland, uh, Brandywine, Maryland posted a typed note on its doors reflecting new store hours closing at 6 p.m. rather than 8 or 9 p.m. I shopped there in late August and asked the clerk about mod the modified hours. Her response, most of our staff is in college, so we have to rehire all of those positions now since they all left to go back to school. Our right, Andy Mac 14, our local store has been operating with minimal staff for a while now. I went recently and they hardly had any Halloween stuff. It didn't appear to be sold out, just not a lot stocked. We usually have one employee at the cut table and one at the register. I'm in Bakersfield, California. If they do close stores, I wouldn't be surprised if ours ends up on the list. We have lost a lot of stores in the last few years. Whew. I love Kitty 3. The Joann's I go to in Middletown, New York is always a mess. I don't like going there. Wow. Okay. Lee Estrada, this is news to me. Two, haven't been into a local Joanne store in a long while. Mostly do online shopping with them. Sorry to see this is happening to them. What a shame. I feel for the staff and employees that are underworked, uh, overworked and underpaid. I know, right? Okay, let's see here. All right, I think we got through. Let's see. I think we got. Okay, yes, we got through all of the Instagram comments. Thank you to everyone that commented on Instagram. Uh, next, we're going to go to YouTube from the last show. We got a lot of, uh, a lot of comments there. Woo, lot of, let me kind of refresh too to see if we got any more. Let's see here. All right, that's that's a fun facial expression, right? Let me try to find one that doesn't make me look crazy. All right, here we go. <laughs> Sorry guys, I got to mute my mic real quick because I need to like kind of cough. Hold on a second. Okay. All right. Let's go to YouTube. Let's check out some of the YouTube's comments. By the way, thank you to everyone that commented here. Every, lots, like, lots of you guys are telling me what's going on in the store, and I really appreciate that. Uh, Thimble Book says, I've only bought fabric from Joann's once because their sales always felt like regular retail pricing. It took one, $1 and $2 patterns to get me in the store, and now the pattern sales aren't even as often. All right, Jackie says, Jen, I was at my Joann's last week and it was an absolute nightmare. The store was a mess, fabric bolts all over the floor, inventory in boxes all over the store, not put away, and only three employees in this huge store, all working with no urgency. My store is still busy and I waited 30 minutes to get a piece of felt cut, then uh, a felt cut, then stood in line with 20 customers in front of me with one slow cashier uh, ringing customers at a snail pace. So frustrating. So all I said was Hobby Lobby. Here I come. Ooh. Oh, boy. All right. Uh, Lynette says, from a friend who used to work at Joanne, casual is basically part-time, open availability, uh, willing to take unwanted hours from other employees and on call. I actually applied there and was turned away for my availability, uh, which I get, but most part-time employees want to work the day shift, and they wanted me to fill this casual position. Okay. Oh, excuse me. Lisa, thank you, Lisa, watched watched a new sewing channel talking about going to a Joanne store and it was closed. If I remember correctly, she said there was a sign that said they didn't have enough employees. 
uh, to open the store and to come back later. She went back later and it was still closed. She ran into the manager outside the store and she confirmed she didn't have any employees to open. And this was in the Northern California area. Uh, was in a, all right, Nanette says, was in a Joann's recently after a few decades. Wow. One of the employees there told me they just laid off all of their full-time employees. I thought, hmm, they must be in trouble. Then I noticed, yes, the more selection, uh, they had more selection of fabric, but it is so unkempt and messy. It was like rummaging through a garage sale. A second thought, they can't compete like this for long. Wondered if there will be clearance sales in the near future. Of the employees there, no one knew anything. Prices were to find stuff. The answer we got was, I'm new part-time. All right. Um, DIY dilet Dilettante, I'm not sure. Uh, Joanne is now advertising in my pop-ups that they ship internationally now. I live in Saudi Arabia. Shipping and import fees are prohibitive for me, but I do have to really scramble uh, for decent threads here. Gorgeous fabrics abound. All right, Koga Bear 1. The Joannes I shop at is a small one, so most of its space is dedicated to the thread arts. It hasn't changed in over 20 years that I've been shopping there. Oh, boy. Okay, Marisol sent, like, a, sent a very long comment. I'm not going to read all of it, but um, Marisol, thank you for watching on your TV. And you used to work at Cloth World in the 70s, and it sounded like it was a lot, um, let's just say, a lot more of a, uh, a uh, you know, an efficient and uh, pleasant experience. Um, but thank you for your comments. Store was always clean, organized, and welcoming. And it sounds like you had a good experience there. Um, and you had a lot of other work too. So thank you for that. All right, Carmen says, I was in a Joann's a couple days ago. Didn't notice empty shelves, but did notice repeated goods and less variety in fabrics. Uh, bridal and formal fabrics, at least half of what, what it has normally been. Low selection of trim and ribbon, no woolens or trill, twills, but did see flannel, uh, baby upholstery. I saw three employees, one at the cutting table, one checker, and one manager. Sounds about right in what everyone else is reporting to. I went in for Christmas fabric and didn't really see Christmas anything there. All right, Vanessa, the Joann's in Hudson, Ohio is well organized. The store is neat and well stocked. All right, um, Denise, I never, I've never seen the framing department staffed at my local Joann's. Uh, usually they just have a bunch of inventory stacked in front of it. I prefer Joann's over Michael's for batting, quilting, sewing supplies, and crochet embroidery. A cross-stitch kit. Uh, Michael seems fine for scrapbooking floor on cake decorating, but they don't have much fabric, and what they do have isn't great. I agree about fabric at Joann's. Uh, they don't seem to have much garment fabric, such as knits, stretch knits, etc. All right, we're going to, I'm kind of going to sift through these. My voice is starting to get a little hoarse here. Okay, let's see here. Um, all right, you say, Linda says the Joann's on Long Island has closed three small stores and opened one small superstore. Interesting. All right, Polyester BB, if Joann's wanted to stay in business, they shouldn't throw away, they should. They wouldn't throw away their knowledgeable full-time employees for people who are willing to work uh, for minimum wage and no benefits. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. All right. Danette, oh my, OMG, this is sad. I live in Jamaica, but when I visit the U.S., Joann's is one of my favorite stores to shop in. All right, with the rising cost of groceries and gas, something's got to give in the family household. Therefore, buying crafts and fabric and all of those fun things goes to the wayside. I like your username, Valley Girl for Life Creations. I love that. $100 in gas or $100 in fabric. Um, I'll take the gas, lol. Thank you for that. All right, Debbie, how about if you applied as a teacher... Eh, I don't know. I Here's the thing. I kind of do that on the internet. So like, I don't really have a reason to do it at a Joann's. All right, morning. All right, and uh, thank you, Polyester BB. Uh, replay, 212 more subscribers. Come on, everyone. Thank you uh, for that. So those are the YouTube comments here. Thank you for everyone who left a comment or and watched and everything. And thank you. We have gotten a good number of subscribers the past couple of days. And I really appreciate that, guys. I... I need to get to 1,000 subscribers here on Sewing Report Live uh, to get monetized. Greatly appreciate it because um, it helps me. It would help me do more stuff like this. Uh, this type of reporting takes time. It takes energy. Uh, it takes knowledge, which I do have a background in. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not really easy to do. Uh, so if I can get this channel monetized, that would really help. Okay. <clears throat> All right, let's see. Um, Carmen, for those looking for quality garment fabric, I highly recommend 
Elfreed's Fabrics in Boulder, Colorado. She sells online and her staff is great. Cool. Thank you for uh, the recommendation. All right. Jay Lester. I do. I love Joanne's. I don't like your use of expletive language, JL. Hey, you know what? Here's the thing. I This is me. I, you know, if you're not into colorful language, that's totally cool. I understand. Every once in a while, I can get a little spicy. That's just how it is. You know, if it's not for you, it's not for you. I get it. All right. Karen says the employees do the best they can. Yeah. It sounds like the employees are working on, yeah, like they're, I just can't imagine working at Joanne's right now. I don't know. That's, it's rough. It is rough. All right. Vanessa says the pattern sales for Joanne's are on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. All right. So lovely with Grace. Thank you again. Really appreciate all your efforts, Jen. Yeah. Like these are, these are kind of difficult shows to do. Like it's not just hanging out and like chilling. Um, I, you know, again, I had like, I, I really wanted to source everything um, and not go on like what I thought or like rumors around the internet. Cause that's not like, that's not very helpful. Um, so I really wanted to just stick with stuff that was that I had like an attributable source for, but um, that's why I wanted to kind of, um, I wanted to sort of get like a complete picture for you of this former CEO, Wade Michelon. You can make your own judgment, you know, about him. You know, I'm just like, after reading this, I was like, I had no idea about this backstory, um, you know, and hey, now you know, now I know. And, you know, this might, this might help us get a better picture of why Joanne's is currently in this situation. Uh, Cause it's, it's just not looking good for Joanne's. Let's go back to the street article here. If you are kind of, um, let's see, actually, is this the one I was talking about? Let's see here. So if you are kind of new or you're like kind of tuning in late, um, we are talking about Joanne's and, uh, Things aren't going well for Joanne. So this is the latest. The street is reporting that um, Joanne's is in trouble and they've been put on bankruptcy watch. Uh, another beloved retailer may disappear. Uh, the company has issued a warning and laid off staff and that may not stop it from running out of cash, even though it insists it won't. Um, so let's go through this again. Let's see, because we went through this the other day. Uh, but we're seeing this through a lot of the corporate sector with these retail stores. Um, people just aren't spending as much money. And we also got like kind of an artificial um, boost during COVID because people were home. They had more time. They were looking to do stuff like this. And I do think that I do think that what's happening Joanne to Joanne is happening to other businesses, happening to Bad Bath and Beyond and Christmas tree shops. And it looks like Joanne's is also low on cash and they have over a billion dollars in debt. They've also had some quarterly losses. They've recently laid off. Um, it was just announced that they've laid off one of their executives, uh, Tom Dreyer, the VP and controller. And I believe he was also the act, the interim, the former interim chief financial officer. This news was just out today. This is like the breaking news uh, that Joanne's has terminated Tom Dreyer, who literally was on like the company leadership website when I checked like yesterday. So he's now gone. And this is the, we'll take a look at the current Joanne leadership here. This is, so these are the people, these eight people are currently in charge at Joanne. These two guys, Christopher and Scott, are the co-interim CEOs. And that is because their most recent CEO, Wade Michelon, uh, conveniently retired this May after a couple of years of a very tumultuous uh, performance at this company. So Wade is gone. He got his golden parachute. He got his millions of dollars. He got $392,000 as a severance. He's kicking back and retiring and leaving, you know, all these other people to kind of deal with the, with the chaos here. But it does seem to be like this company is in trouble. And also, if you are kind of just tuning in, even though this is the Joanne's uh, corporate management, a private equity group called 
let's see, what's the Leonard Green and Partners is the actual, they're the, so this company, this company, this private equity management firm actually controls over two thirds of Joanne's publicly traded stock. So you'll see a couple of these familiar faces. These two people are on the Joanne uh, board of directors. Uh, so LG, LGP had purchased Joanne in 2011, took it public in 2021, and also owns about 16, at least at the time of the IPO, they also owned 69% of Joanne uh, stock. So they, even though they had technically opened it up for trading and common folks like you and me can own Joanne stock, these people are still calling the shots. They are, oh wait, still, sorry, I forgot to switch the tab. LG, LGP, this private equity firm, they are still calling the shots. They're still in control. They are the ones who are choosing the Joanne management team. They are the ones that have the majority of the board of directors. So this is the board of directors here at Joanne. And uh, and things are not going well. So that's sort of the latest with Joanne. Do we know what's going to happen? We really don't. I, I do plan to do an update. I will be doing some update streams as things are happening and as we're learning more. I am seeing some rumors, but they are not confirmed. So I'm not going to be sharing that. But if I can get some like confirmed reporting, then I will be uh, bringing that to you. But yeah, that's that's what I got to say, guys. It's been a wild day or so, man. I'm thinking this weekend also I might try to go to a uh, Joann's and like check it out for myself. Um, it's a little difficult. My husband and I share a car, um, so you know since I work at home, there like my husband's car died like last year, and because I mostly work here, we kind of thought, hey, let's try to do the one car thing. Um, and I found it's actually not bad. Uh, but again, it is, it does limit like, you know, me going out places. I get my groceries delivered, uh, but we do save quite a bit of money from not having the expenses of that other car, not having to pay car insurance and not having to pay gas. So that's what's up with me. I, you know, I'm not getting paid the big bucks like Wade Michelon or the folks on the, uh, Joanne. I mean, you know, but Hey, again, I will throw it out to you guys. If there's anyone watching and you're on the Joanne corporate leadership team, or if you're Wade Michelon and you just want to air out your dirty laundry and you don't have an NDA, you're welcome uh, to come on Sewing Report Live and I'd be happy to uh, have a live conversation with you. DM me on Instagram at Sewing Report. Hit me up, guys. Hit me up in the DMs. Also, if you are a Joanne employee or former employee and there's just something you want to share, uh, you can remain anonymous, and I may share your comment in a future show, so we could do that. Uh, but yeah, so that's what's going on. Um, so I want to ask you guys, uh, what do you think? What do you think is going to happen with Joanne's? Do you think Joanne's can be saved? Uh, do you think Joanne's is going to shut down? Do you think Joanne's is going to file for bankruptcy or do some sort of move that allows them to stay in business, maybe with some heavy changes, but still stay? Um, you know, alive, you know, I don't know. I feel like anything's possible. If Bed Bath & Beyond can go out of business, I, you know, anything, who knows? Like, who knows? Right, I'm going to take a quick water break here. Guys, let's turn on the music again. I got to like sniffle a little bit. So I'm going to turn on the music again and mute myself for like a quick second here. All right. All right. We've got F Pixel. By the way, do you moved from Twi Twitch to YouTube? Wow. Thank you. Uh, they'll probably reboot just like Tuesday morning. That's like, that's a possibility. Um, you know, one example of that, I love that store Esprit and they've gone through like several different like life cycles. They were out of business for a while and now they're like back here. I'll show you guys. Um, I have like Esprit clothing from back in the day and I always loved their clothing. And it looks like they've now have like a new, like they've kind of been like rebooted. So I mean, or maybe Joann's would go online only, or maybe Joann's could get acquired, you know, by like Amazon. Who the heck knows? I don't know. Um, so I'll show you guys this. 
So this is like one of my favorite OG like clothing lines, Esprit. And I just love like I I have some like I still have like a very cool fleece like um fleece jacket. They used to have an outlet store near me. Then they like closed. Now they're like back. So I mean that's the thing. Joanne still has like the name recognition and the name brand, and that's worth something. So maybe that's valuable to somebody else. So it could get bought out. Like who knows? So sorry, I'm gonna all right, we'll take this off here. We don't all right, hold on a second. So, I mean, I feel like there's a lot of possibilities. And we also saw that with Craftsy, too. Craftsy got acquired by NBC Universal. Then they were going to go out of business. Then they got, like, acquired by some other company, you know. So, like, I, I don't think this is... The, I don't know if I think this is, like, the end for Joann's or anything like that. You know, I, I don't know. I feel like this is, like, a very wild time and anything is possible. Yes, Esprit from Junior. Yes, like I just love, I love the like um the vibe of Esprit. It's like totally me. It's very preppy. I love preppy clothing. So that was totally my totally my vibe. I just love, I just love Esprit. So I was really happy to see Esprit come back. You know, if they have an another good sale, I might like I might hit them up. I don't know. I might hit them up. But uh yeah, let me. I might stick around for a little bit and then I'll probably sign off a little bit. Uh, I did already kind of eat something, so I'm not super, I'm not starving today. Um, but yeah, if you have any suggestions um, or comments about Joann's or if you have any insider information, uh, you're welcome to either leave a comment below on this uh, live stream replay or you can DM me on Instagram. If you are an employee or an ex-employee and you got something you want to say, um, you know, I'd love to hear from you. And Wade Mickelon, former CEO, you know, if you want to come on a random YouTube channel, you know, hey, why, you know, why not? So Wade, Wade is now retired. So yeah, you got, Wade, you got some extra time now. If you want to tell us about what happened with Joanne, and about your time there, uh, you're welcome. Hit me up on Instagram at Sewing Report, and we can do like a you know you can come on live with me. It'd be fun. I might ask you some tough questions, but I'll be fair. You know, no hate. I also want to hear about your experience with Elizabeth Holmes and and Theranos. You know, if that's cool, you can me you know you can you can you know you can but you can have your piece. We can talk for an hour, two hours, three hours, however long you want. It'd be it'd be great, right? It'd be cool. I'm sure I'm sure he would do that, right? Yeah, no, no, there's no way in hell. There is no way in hell anyone from Joanne's is uh in corporate leadership is ever gonna talk to me. Like th that's never gonna happen. So I already know that, but I'm just I'm really just joking about this. So I'm just joking. Um, but I appreciate everyone tuning in tonight. Again, if you have not on your way out, be sure to hit that like button, guys. Subscribe to Sewing Report Live. I need to get to a thousand subscribers in order to get this channel uh, monetized so that doing these shows, we can do more of them and not have to rely so much on trying to do things like sponsorships because I really don't. That's the thing. Like, if I do any sort of sponsorships, I don't do any if I can't say whatever I want. And that eliminates like most of my opportunities for any type of sponsorships or brand deals. Because most companies just won't do that. Um, and that's something that I'm, you know, that's like my deal breaker. And that's what I've committed to. So I don't want to do that. But, you know, yeah, exactly. It's worth a try. You know, maybe Wade wants to say something. Maybe Wade out there, you know, maybe he's learning to sew now that he's not working. I don't know. So I want to give Wade a chance. You know, you never know if you don't ask, right? You never know. But I appreciate everyone tuning in tonight. It's been a great time. And... I will keep you guys updated in the community tab of this channel. So if you go ahead, subscribe, you can get all the updates, get notified about the live streams, check out the sewing report Etsy shop. And, you know, and also if you have any friends, sewing friends, tell them about this channel. Um, I'm trying to get all of the, uh, you know, trying to grow enough where at least, at least YouTube will pay me to do this channel. That would be awesome. But I hope everyone has a great evening. Good one, and I will continue to keep you updated. Anyways, I'm Jen, and you have been watching uh, Sewing Report Live. I'll see you guys again in the next one. And remember, whatever you're doing, make it fun.